Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Thursday Night Calls with Roots Action. We have an awesome call tonight scheduled. Uh, we're going to be talking about how sanctions actually worsen the COVID-19 pandemic globally, how that affects us here at home, and what people are doing about it. And we have two amazing speakers on with us tonight that we're going to be talking to, Leonardo Flores from Code Pink and Hania Jodat Barnes from all sorts of places, including Roots Action. We'll get there in just a moment. Um, thank you all for joining us. As always, I like to describe what we do on these calls. And really the point of these are to be educational. We want people to learn things, learn about the policies and, and the actions that are taking place. We want them to be engaging. We do a Q&A. So if you have any questions about anything, please add them to the chat and we will discuss them. We will get those questions answered. And most importantly, we want to provide opportunities for people to take real actions, to participate in democracy beyond just voting, to contact their representatives, and we make it as easy as possible to do that. So hang tight. At the end of our discussion, we will move on to the action. Um, and yeah, I'm really excited about that. And as, as always, we welcome feedback. So let me do, know what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong, and we will improve every single week. We are live streaming on Facebook now, so you can catch this on Facebook right now, tomorrow, anytime, and we will be uploaded to YouTube tomorrow at some point well, uh, when I wake up and get to it, because I'm always tired after these calls, so it's all right. Um, couple quick updates before I introduce our speakers. Uh, we've been really focused the last couple of weeks on rejecting Rahm Emanuel. We've put together a huge coalition of groups, both Chicago-based and national ba uh, nationally based. And frankly, it's going really well, I feel like. He's on his heels. There's nonstop articles coming out, um, just blasting him, uh, citing our coalition. Um, and I have not heard a whole bunch of people coming to his aid at the national stage. Um, on the national stage. So that makes me feel really good, um, really proud of our work at Roots Action and the dozens of other groups who are participating in that coalition. So thank you everybody who has uh, emailed their senators, who have called, who have wrote uh, letters to the editor, um, who have done everything uh, that we've made available. Thank you all so much. Um, we're not done. It's not over yet, but I feel really good about it so far. So that's awesome. Couple other quick things. Um, next week on this call, we will have members of the California Democratic Party uh, to talk about progressives from the California Democratic Party um, talking about their upcoming party chair and officer elections and why that is so important for setting the agenda for the party. Um, so be prepared for that one. That's gonna be a great call. Um, and then on April 15th, in a couple weeks, we're going to have Abdul El Saeed on to talk about Medicare for All. I know people have been asking, when are we going to do a Medicare for All call? We got it lined up now. So Ab Abdul El Saeed, he ran for governor of Michigan. Um, he's awesome. He's awesome. So I'm really excited about that one. And lastly, we have started the what I'm calling the Roots Action Community Leaders Program. You may have gotten an email about that uh, if you didn't see it. You will, because I'm going to be sending more of them. We are looking for people like you um, who want to be leaders in their own community, who want to be liaisons for Roots Action to your own representatives, uh, to what's going on in the, on the ground in your own neighborhoods, in your own communities. So if you are interested in that, send me a message um, and we will get you set up. We want to help you. We want to empower you, train you, give you the resources you need uh, to make an impact locally. So really excited about that. Um, and so, yeah, reach out anytime if you want to get involved with that. If you have not yet joined our team, you can join our volunteer team at nohoneymoon.org. I would ask you to invite your friends, share it with people, let other, let everyone you know uh, know that we have a team here that is going to fight the establishment, no matter if it's Democrats or Republicans in office. And that is what we have been doing nonstop. We voted Trump out and the fight never ended. We are continuing to push forward. We are continuing to pressure Biden to get the progressive policies we need. Um, so yes, please, if you haven't joined, nohoneymoon.org, share it with your friends. Um, and so with that, we will move on to our discussion now. Um, so tonight we're gonna be focusing on how sanctions impact and worsen the COVID-19 pandemic globally. And so 
we decided we, to bring on two people who were born in countries that deal with sanctions from the US government and who are experts on policy and on all sorts of stuff. Let me just introduce them real quick. Um, first, we have Hanye Jodat Barnes. She is the president and co-founder of Muslim Delegates and Allies. She is the director of PDA Middle East Alliances, and she was born in Iran. And she is the Roots Action Partnerships Coordinator. So I work with her every day, and she's wonderful. Thank you, Brian. We also have Leonardo Flores, who is the Latin America Campaign Coordinator for Code Pink, and Code Pink is awesome. Um, he has been an analyst on US-Venezuela relations. He was born in Venezuela and maintains close ties to the social movements that have influenced that country over the past two decades. Thank you very much, Leonardo, for being here as well. Thanks for the invite, Ryan. Absolutely. Um, so I guess to start, uh, we'll start with you, Leonardo. Um, generally speaking, sanctions and COVID, what is the interplay there? How do sanctions affect COVID? What is going on? Well, in terms of the pandemic itself, it's going to depend on each individual country, right? So, but I'll give you the experience from Venezuela. But in, in every country, the sanctions, what they've done is really harm the economy broadly. So in Venezuela, for example, the sanctions have caused a 99% drop in oil revenue. And we're talking about a country where 90% of its foreign income comes from oil. So it's been a huge huge blow to the economy. Uh, there are estimates that the sanctions have cost the economy any, anywhere from $31 billion to $194 billion. You know, kind of just mind boggling numbers that are really kind of hard to comp comprehend. But in terms of lives, you know, the sanctions have already, in, in just the first year alone, according to the Center for Economic and Policy Research, a think tank in DC, the sanctions killed 40,000 Venezuelans. That was in 2017, 2018. And I, the Alfred Desaias, who is a, a former UN special, <laughs> In, uh, special Rapporteur updated that number last year, to, and he said it was something closer to 100,000 Venezuelans that have died in the past four years because of sanctions. So the main way that the sanctions are affecting Venezuela in terms of the pandemic is that really the sanctions almost kind of caused the pandemic beforehand in the sense that because of this drop in government revenue, there has the, the health sector has been completely devastated in Venezuela. So you have, you know, maternal mortality doubled, uh, undernourishment rose from 2% to 13.4%. Uh, you had, uh, I mean, I'm sure you might, may have seen it a couple of years ago, there was a big measles outbreak in Venezuela. And of course, everyone was blaming the government. But the actual problem was that the banks were not processing the purchases, purchases for measles vaccines because of a thing called overcompliance which is when banks and other kind of financial institutions and just businesses too, are so scared of being sanctions, sanctioned or of running afoul of the sanctions that they prefer not to do business with the government in question, even when it comes to things like food and medicine, which are specifically granted ex exemptions through the sanctions, but in practice, these exemptions don't work at all. Uh, so in Venezuela, you know, you have it's been doing very well in terms of containing the pandemic, uh, especially compared to its neighbors. I mean, Latin America is one of the worst performing regions in the world in terms of we've, what we've seen, say, in Brazil, where they're creeping up on 300,000 deaths. Uh, they said they're going to hit 500,000 deaths by the summer. Brazil's about a third, maybe a little bit bigger, a third the size of the U.S. So these are really numbers that are even worse than what we're seeing here in the U.S. Um, but you know, because of public policy, they've been able to maintain the numbers fairly low, but that policy has costs and those costs come in, the, in terms of the economy, education. So Venezuela has basically had a strict quarantine in place since la almost a year ago, exactly, really. And so they do this thing called seven by seven, where you have seven days of a very strict quarantine, followed by seven days of partial openings. And that's how they've managed to keep the economy kind of going. But everything has been affected, right? So, uh, you know, even a year ago, it was really kind of hard to explain to, to U.S. audiences what it's like to live in a country under sanctions. But the pandemic has kind of changed that because I see a lot of parallels uh, between the effects of the pandemic here in the U.S. and, and, and the effects of sanctions abroad. In term, in the, and what I mean is that, like, the sanctions affect everyone and everything when you're talking about a country that is, is you know, heavily sanctioned as Venezuela or Iran, Nicaragua, Syria, Cuba, the list goes on and on, of course. But when you're so heavily sanctioned, it affects everything in terms of, you know, prices of food goes up, it becomes harder to find gasoline, 
your whole life is up, upended and you've really done nothing wrong, right? Because these are ordinary Venezuelans, ordinary people in Iran and Nicaragua, all these countries, they're not the enemy of anyone. And yet they're being punished severely by the US government. Uh, that secret report I mentioned says that sanctions are a form of collective punishment and collective punishment is a war crime. So, so when, when I talk about sanctions, I you know, always have to underline their illegality. Sanctions are really only supposed to be imposed by the United Nations Security Council, but the United States has been imposing them on a unilateral uh, basis for years and years, and, and it has a really high cost on civilians, of course. In terms of how the sanctions are affecting Venezuela's pandemic response, I mean, it first certainly has delayed the purchases of vaccines, uh, you know, I think that's one of the areas where Venezuela is doing the worst right now regionally is that it hasn't been able to get these vaccines, despite the fact that Venezuela has $7 billion of cash frozen in banks abroad, and the sanctions prevent this cash from being even used to buy food and medicine. It's really kind of, uh, you know, a, a, a horror. I mean, that, that's the only way to really describe it. Um, and so I, before I I want to end my this little intro just by reading this quote from a, a, a peasant leader that we had on a Code Pink webinar a couple of days ago, a week ago rather. And he said, referring to the sanctions, he said, it's like a war. The first bomb hasn't fallen here. It's a different sort of war, but it remains a war that affects all of us. Wow. That's all. Yeah, wow. And, and, you know, I think we all know who war affects most is poor people, working people. And when you talk about the sanctions um, have already made a community essentially, you know, they don't have gasoline. They're, it's almost like who in the US is getting hurt the most by COVID are those working class people, are poor people. And if you take do that to an entire country, I can only imagine how difficult it would be to manage that. Um, lots of important points you made here that I wrote down I wanna get back to. Uh, but first, uh, Hanye, um, in general, what are these sanctions doing and how are they impacting countries like Iran? Thank you, Ryan. And, and uh, thank you, Leonardo, for describing the situation in Venezuela as it currently stands. Um, I First and foremost, before I start, I really do want to thank you um, again, Ryan and, and Resection for the opportunity to talk about this global catastrophe called sanctions that is really not often not talked about um, and discussed. Um, anytime I get to share this space with my colleagues, uh, you know, it's always an honor and I'm very humbled. I'll spend some time uh, talking about what sanctions uh, are meant to do according to the governments imposing them and what they really end up doing. Um, according to the White House, I would say sanctions are economic punishments on countries that pose a threat to our national security or the instability in a region or violate human rights. Um, the UN Security Council defines them as um, final steps before taking military action against a, uh, a government. In other words, I would say a, it's a, a backdoor attempt at a regime change. Um, sanctions uh, disrupt um, economies and contribute to a very slow, painful suffering of the people in targeted countries, as, as, as Leonardo mentioned uh, earlier. Um, Unfortunately, those who suffer the most are women, children, cancer patients, and those struggling with uh, chronic illnesses. And it pains me to say this as a child of war, but um, when bombs drop, they take a life within a second, but suffering from a hunger or poverty uh, is prolonged and it's a very unjustifiable, unethical death. Um, unfortunately, um, the president of the United States has the power to um, impose um, unconstitutional sanctions uh, within a flick of a, a pen, um, often without congressional approval. And uh, since sanctions on vulnerable populations are unilateral, as was mentioned earlier, they violate international laws under the UN Charter and the uh, Fourth Geneva Convention. Uh, I'll speak briefly about Iran uh, uh, to my country women and men who are just the most resilient people and uh, whose ancestors have built one of the earliest civilizations. Um, it's very unfortunate that for the past few decades, for I'd say since the 1970s, since the hostage crisis, Iran has been under a number of economic sanctions. And uh, when Trump's administration abandoned the JCPOA um, and 
you know, it's very important to note also that Iran still remained within the requirements of the Iran deal and abided by those guidelines um, even a year after Trump made the irresponsible decision to pull out. But extreme unconstitutional unilateral sanctions have been imposed to, uh, on our banks. Um, our country's assets have been frozen, shipping, energy, and most uh, important, our petroleum. And um, it's also very important to recognize that that Trump doesn't only um, or didn't only place these sanctions on Iran's economy, but also countries that purchase oil from Iran. Uh, the countries uh, were given about a six month waiver uh, before they had to stop uh, their dealings with Iran and uh, before facing heavy fines if they did in fact uh, decide to work with the government of Iran. Bottom line is sanctions do not work. Um, not as envisioned by the US government anyway. Um, while they cause pain and suffering um, and disrupt economies, they have not led to the downfall of the governments of Iran, Venezuela, Nicaragua, North Korea. Um, and to continue these sanctions um, on these countries during a global pandemic is, is criminal. And for targeted countries uh, who often cannot access COVID-19 uh, vaccines or medical supplies, it's so immoral. Um, and I often have to bring up the Persian Gulf War um, in the 90s and um, the economic sanctions that were imposed um, by the Security Council that resulted in over 500,000 children under the uh, age of uh, five uh, dying in Iraq because of uh, malnutrition, cancer, and other simple sometimes illnesses that could have been prevented by um, medicine that we buy over, over the counter here. Um, and I often have to ask, when did we become this empire that decides whose or which child's life is worth saving and uh, which child's life isn't? So. Yeah, yeah. and it's, um, it's rarely which child is worth saving and it's, it's usually which child is, do we not care if they die? Seems more like it. Um, and one thing you said is really interesting too, is in it just pointing out from my own education, growing up in the States and going to not good schools, um, there's a big difference between what we're taught sanctions are supposed to do and what they actually do. Um, why do we, and, and Hanye sticking with you for a moment, why, why do you think we pretend they work? Um, if, if they just clearly haven't, why, is there a reason why you think maybe we stick with this? Sure. Um, we've known all along and I'll give you a very simple answer. It's uh, because of sometimes, because of the, the geopolitical resources of, of some of these countries that we're targeting. And that's just as simple as that. It was the same way with Iraq. It may be the same way with Iran. And it's uh, oftentimes about protecting the allies in that region rather than really um, protecting all equally, right? So. Right. Uh, Leonardo, going back to you, um, you know, in, in the United States, we're, we learn awful things about Venezuela and it's really hard to parse what's real and what's not. Um, why should why do you think Americans should care about sanctions making COVID nineteen worse? Um, why should Americans care about this issue? Well, I mean, for the one thing, I think we should all care about each other. I mean, on a, just a very basic human level, we really should care. I mean, it's of course it's much harder to care about someone who might be a thousand, five thousand miles away that you've never seen, but. If you know that your government is doing something to harm people abroad, people that are innocent, that have nothing to do with these kind of geopolitical ambitions or aspirations that the, the US government has, then I think we have a moral responsibility to speak up and say something and say, look, this isn't the way. We have to find a different method to, to overcome our differences. Issuing these broad sanctions, as Hanya said, isn't working at all. And it's really just harming people and doing it in a pandemic is insane because viruses know no borders, right? right. So if the, if the pandemic had actually been really bad in Venezuela, which was really my big fear of just about a year ago, a little over a year ago when, I, when we saw that it was coming 
And I was freaking out because I know that Venezuela has been so battered by the sanctions that I didn't see how they could possibly pull it off. And they, they did, luckily. But if they hadn't, it would have spread everywhere, right? Even more, even faster, because as we know, there are lots of migrants leaving Venezuela. Actually, during the pandemic, you've had 200,000 migrants return to Venezuela uh, because the pandemic's response has been so bad in the rest of Latin America. But I mean, you know, if we don't take care of this, the pandemic and see it as a holistic thing, if we focus on individual countries, then it's gonna be continue to affect everyone in the world for years and years to come. It might just be economic effects for here, people here in the US, but those the economics matter as well, right? I mean, if it leads to job losses, which it might, then we're gonna have you know, poor and working class folks have, have, having a harder go of it here. Absolutely, and it, it's, um... You know, Biden takes over uh, the presidency, and one of his promises, or one of the things he said, is we're not, we shouldn't be politicizing COVID nineteen. That's something you hear a lot, but clearly, we are politicizing it just at, on the international stage. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, when the pandemic was first hitting, you had officials from the Trump administration, you know, openly wondering how they could take advantage of it to further their goals for regime change, specifically in Venezuela and Iran. And so you would think that the Biden administration would distance itself from that as much as possible and as quickly as possible, but they haven't. And although we have this COVID review, which was very welcome, uh, that you know Biden announced on his very first day in office, I believe it was, uh, you know, I think there's some questions that need to be raised about it now because we're two months in and we've seen no progress. What we're, we've heard behind the scenes is that this may take up to you know six, eight months to happen. By then, the pandemic might not be as big an issue in the U.S., so you're already losing all this momentum that you could have had. So, so it's a big concern. I am glad, though, that you know the issue of sanctions, especially in the last four or six months, it's gotten a lot more uh, uh, critical analysis, uh, particularly from grassroots groups. But it's that, and that's filtering its way up to the political establishment now. Yeah, Hanye, um, so something we kind of talked about earlier today. Um, you know, in terms of how does this pandemic, how does our sanctions uh, on these other countries that is making COVID-19 worse, how is that affecting us here in the U.S.? And I remember we were talking specifically about the people and how they feel and how they may react to this 10 years from now, 20 years from now. So, yeah, how, how is this affecting us here in the U.S.? Not so much why do we care, but how is it really affecting us now and in the future? Well, from a moral uh, standpoint, and thank you for this question because it's very important, um, it only emboldens those regimes that violates human rights anyway, uh, violate human rights anyway. So, but again, I said this before, it is a bit concerning that America has become this deciding factor um, on who gets to live and who gets to die. And um, I think when you commit war crimes and make people of a particular region of the world suffer uh, due to hunger, pain, um, it should always be a, a very morally concerning for us as a country, in particular in a so-called democracy that oftentimes uh, tuples regimes uh, for the sake of uh, a democracy and polices the world. Uh, when you hold food and medicine as a bargaining tool, um, you're giving power to terror and instability and extremism um, within those regions uh, that happen to be of, of our concern. And let's be very honest about this. Most uh, countries um, like Iraq, for example, that were sanctioned heavily um, by the US in the 1990s were allies of the US once upon a time. I mean, I remember the war of Iran and Iraq, and I remember um, how much suffering our country had to go through. And we haven't bounced back um, since that time, and um, we will never bounce back from it. And on top of that, sanctions now during COVID and uh, just before. But I do have to say, no mother has to suffer um, the loss of their child as a price of two governments inadequacies and, and um, uh, bargaining back and forth. No child should be used as a tool. It is morally wrong. And if we remain quiet about it, we're just as responsible as the United States government and those governments that impose these sanctions that cost lives. 
Um, in Iran, for example, um, uh, women, pregnant women who um, oftentimes um, may mis uh, have, a, have miscarriage um, could prevent that by having medication that is not accessible to them right now. And in North Korea, women are having to resort to prostitution because there are no jobs, right? And there's poverty. So you're stripping people from their identity, from, um, from thriving, and you can't make friends that way in those regions of the world, right? So. Right. And, you know, it's, I remember I was 13 when we invaded Iraq. I'm 30 now. Um, and we're still over there. And I remember, you know, one of the first political terms I learned was blowback. And this idea that when we're bombing people, when we're drone striking children, when we're blowing up wedding parties, that we're creating more hate and more, or hate is, you know, that's something that has been embedded in my brain now, animosity, dislike, disdain for the United States. Do you think the same thing is going on now in countries like Iran and Venezuela? Um, should I go or Leo? Did you want to go ahead and then same question uh, to Leonardo? Of course, of course. Again, um, we unfortunately the United States in that region of the world doesn't have the best reputation, and especially now with Trump pulling out of the JCPOA. Um, and allowing other countries to have nuclear power um, in the same region um, has, has uh, really uh, broken the trust. Even when you talk about, uh, when you talk to the civilians who, Iran is a very young country. Iran is a, a young um, 80 million people country. And so when you talk to them, talk to civilians, they say, why is it that other countries have access to nuclear power, but we can, right? Um, and it always reminds me of, of the coup of 1959 when Mossadegh decided to um, uh, in, nationalize our oil is, is when M16 and the CIA just decided that that may not be a good idea for Iran to have that much power. So we're pretty much getting blamed for becoming a country that we deserve to be, one of the oldest civilizations um, on our own soil, right? So of course it, creates animosity towards the US. But I have to tell you, Iranian people are some of the most compassionate, some of the most um, uh, kindest people. And so I would bet you anything, Ryan, probably 10 years from now, um, they'll still, you know, love Americans um, the way they do now. So yeah, uh, Leonardo, same question, Venezuela. Uh, do you think this is creating major blowback there that that could uh, haunt the United States 10 years, 20 years from now? Yes and no. I think people in Venezuela are very quick to distinguish between what the American government does and the, what the people and how they see the people of the United States. And, and I think there's a lot of solidarity for people for the struggles here in the U.S. from Venezuela. So, for example, I, you know, people follow the you know, Black Lives Matter movement and, and everything that happened with the George Floyd up uprising and the protests. Uh, and they know how, how hard workers have it here in terms of unionizing and in terms of having health care, uh, even getting a decent minimum wage. And so they know that the people that they're the victims of the U.S. government that also oppresses its own people. Uh, but it, it, it will have blowback for the United States and because people have long memories. And while there might not be any, any animosity towards the American people, there might be animosity towards American businesses. And there's certainly going to be a kind of reticence to do business or to invite all these U.S. corporations back in when they played a role in abandoning the Venezuelan people when they needed them most. And they've been, you know, playing a role in these attempts at regime change and like, these horrible sanctions. Well, it's, that's good to hear from both of you that, you know, you believe firmly that the people can separate the government uh, from uh, uh, the people and that they they see solidarity and that we too are oppressed by our, our government in so many ways. So that's actually, that actually feels really good to hear. So thank you for that. Um, so uh, we'll stick with you, Leonardo. What is being done about this? Is there anything being done right now uh, through legislation, through organizing, uh, through campaigns to, to stop um, these sanctions, to lift these sanctions? Do you know of anything that's going on right now? Sure. So Code Pink is part of two coalitions. Uh, one of them is called Sanctions Kill, and this is a coalition of grassroots groups that are really seeking to educate the American people 
that sanctions are a weapon of war and not a, a tool of diplomacy, as is so often said. The other coalition is called Lift Sanctions Save Lives. I'll post both of those uh, websites on the chat in a bit. Uh, and that coalition is more Hill-based. And on the Hill, we have seen uh, more and more concern about the impacts of sanctions, particularly from Ilhan Omar's office uh, last year. I think it was in September or so she introduced a series of bills uh, called COSA, Congressional Oversight Over Sanctions. Uh, and, and that would have had a really important impact because it would have forced the American government to review the impact of the, the sanctions that it imposes. For the most part, the US government doesn't hold, have, hold these reviews. Uh, so we are seeing movement and there are a couple of senators as well that are very kind of uh, involved in at least tweeting about ending certain, certain sanctions. Uh, so I'm, I'm kind of, I'm hopeful that, you know, we'll see sanctions relief within the next six months to a year uh, to, to some extent. Uh, but, you know, until we drastically change our foreign policy and say and, and understand that regime change shouldn't be our business anywhere, then I'm afraid sanctions are kind of going to be here to stay. Yeah. And I know, you know, tweets aren't aren't, you know, a big deal, but you, just having those from representatives does spread the word. And it's so important that we if we're on social media, that we do use it to share messages that people need to need to know, not just trolling people in memes, but like really educational stuff and, and making sure that people in those countries know that there's solidarity here with them. Uh, I think that's all really important. Uh, Hanye, um, same question. What is being done about this? I know you're involved with the Lift the Sanctions campaign. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, well, this effort was um, launched in collaboration with uh, Marcy Winograd um, and uh, Progressive Democrats of America, Middle East Alliances. And uh, we um, kind of piggybacked off of uh, Sanctions Killed, um, which is an organization that was just mentioned by Leonardo, um, to ring the alarm and, and uh, organize grassroots activists to really push back and, and put the pressure on their um, Congress members to support um, some of what I'll discuss with you in just a short moment. But uh, just as it was mentioned earlier, um, Representative Omar co-sponsored, um, uh, sponsored, well, uh, introduced a bill um, in 2019-2020, which was co-sponsored by uh, Rashida Taleb, Representative uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Ayanna Presley, um, and uh, to limit the president's power in, in his behavior when it comes to sanctions um, and not make him so reactionary. And uh, a letter um, was also co-authored by Representative uh, Omar Chuy Garcia of uh, Illinois and Senator Elizabeth Warren to reconsider, um, to um, urge the Biden administration to um, take a broader analysis um, uh, on the humanitarian impacts of sanctions um, and to reconsider sanctions um, during uh, COVID. Now, this letter has been signed by many representatives uh, like uh, uh, Representative Barbara Lee, Rokana, Senator Markey, Representative Bush, uh, Lowenthal, and uh, just to only name a few, but I'm very excited actually about um, the most recent bill that was introduced by uh, Chuy Garcia of Illinois called HR 986 to provide a support for a robust global response to COVID-19. And I can share uh, that bill with you. Um, in terms of what we're doing with Lift the Sanctions, um, is we have a petition out that was put together by Roots Action in collaboration with PDA World Beyond War and uh, PDA Middle East Alliances to urge the Biden administration to issue temporary worldwide licenses uh, to um, allow for um, medicine, food, and um, uh, uh, just items that save life to get to these countries that are impacted. But um, we have also, as a delegate to the California Democratic Party, I'm introducing a resolution uh, to uh, the party to lift sanctions blocking COVID relief as well. Um, and I look forward to presenting this resolution because I think it's going to um, really open up everyone's eyes to what happens when we talk about something that's really not talked about a lot, right? That could potentially save millions of lives globally. Um, and I have to tell you, in, in meeting with regions, different regions, to seek endorsement for this particular resolution, um, I am finding that there is 
a, a sense of solidarity within the, the, the grassroots movement um, in the Democratic Party, no matter which side of the aisle you stand on, right? And when we talk about um, human lives being in danger, um, there is that sense of um, solidarity and um, um, grace that you don't necessarily, you know, uh, see usually otherwise. So we're very excited about this and, and uh, lifttosanctions.org, which I'm more than happy to share with you here, the link um, shortly, you can go there, sign our petition and uh, lift the language that you need to contact your Congress member to urge them to, to urge the Biden administration to uh, provide these licenses for also for loans as well, PPE loans. So Excellent. Excellent. And I was actually just, you know, in reading the petition itself, which we will share with everybody here shortly, you know, if you could comment briefly on, so this was the part, it was not confusing me. I just had to read it a couple of times because it's so bizarre that U.S. economic sanctions technically exempt humanitarian items that would be able to help with COVID-19, but everyone is terrified to act on that exemption without some explicit direction from the government. And that's really what we're asking for with this petition, right? Yeah. Like I mentioned earlier, uh, oftentimes it's not just the countries targeted by the U.S. Uh, that go um, that are under sanctions, but it's usually there's also a penalty for for allies that want to to provide help. And Iran, for example, now makes its own medicine, but for cancer patients um, that need. Um, more advanced um, equipment and, 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 and medical um, assistance, uh, that may not be provided to them because countries are now really scared to uh, send in supplies. Um, and if you don't have a syringe, how are you going to give a vaccine shot to someone? Right, right. And it's it's yeah. right. Banks, banks are afraid to do loans and because the, the fines and the do not do business with list that they could end up on uh, would destroy them. And so they're not gonna take those risks uh, which results in death in those countries, like Leonardo was talking about, 100,000 deaths in Venezuela due to sanctions. Oh, that's difficult to even think about. Um, I want to move on to a Q&A. If you have any questions for them, we've, we've touched on some, but if you have additional questions, uh, please add them to the chat. Um, a couple real quick, uh, housekeeping one real quick. Um, if you've signed or if you think you've signed the petition before and you're worried about signing it multiple times, sign it multiple times. Who cares? Go ahead and sign that thing. And, and most importantly, share it, share it, share it, share it. Make sure other people see it. We don't do a ton of petitions here, um, but this is one where we really need to educate people on and we really need to get it out there. And this is a great way to just learn about it and to read about what's going on. I learned a lot just from the, this, this petition alone. I had no idea how the sanctions actually work. So I'm really grateful that we did this cam campaign and, and Hanya, uh, you were uh, a part of that. Um, so thank you for that. Um, David Gordon asks, and this is kind of a complicated one. It's for both of you, uh, Leonardo and Hanya. So whichever one of you wanna hop in, feel free. Um, he says, from a Machiavellian point of view, so you know it's going to be a good question, uh, might sanctions be effective in neutralizing moderates in the target countries, strengthening hardliners who are more anti-American, and thus making uh, the country a more credible target for sanctions? Uh, I think that has to do with like what we were talking about with blowback and uh, creating this disdain for the United States. Do you think th that makes it harder for moderates in those countries? It, whoever. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll go for it. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. So in the case of Venezuela, it's actually, yes, because the USX has actually been sanctioning the moderates as well. Uh, I mean, it, it's a very specific case, Venezuela, because you have moderates that are in the opposition who have participated in the elections over the last couple of years, whereas the hardliners, the, the excuse me, the, the extremist right, the right wing opposition has been boycotting elections. So the opposition in Venezuela is therefore totally split. Wow. And what's been happening is that the Trump administration started sanctioning the moderates for engaging in dialogue and for running in elections and for winning elections. And so the, the effect is that, that that's had is, is you know, first of all, it make, makes it much more difficult for anyone in Venezuela to work with the United States unless they take a very extreme right-wing position 
But also it's, you know, becoming clear to all Venezuelans that what the U.S. is doing and they don't like it. And what we've seen is a huge uh, up, up, uh, increasing trend of people who are against the sanctions. So about two years ago, it was pretty common to see, even among the opposition in Venezuela, people arguing that, oh, the sanctions don't affect the, the economy. That's just propaganda. The sanctions only affect, you know, high ranking officials of the government. Now you have anywhere between 60 to 80% of Venezuelans who are completely against the sanctions. So that it's had a total, the opposite of the effect of what the United States has been going for. Super interesting. Hanya, do you want to add anything there? I mean, ditto uh, to everything uh, Leonardo said, but in terms of Iran, there um, are a number of human rights activists, uh, in particular women who've come out against these extreme sanctions to say they are not working. They are only really um, uh, pushing our middle class into poverty and crippling um, the poor in the country. And um, if in fact anything, the most impact is on women and mothers and children. So um, the hardliners don't ever want for uh, America to have a say so in how uh, things are ran in Iran, right? They've never been um, wanting, they, they've never been interested in a dialogue with uh, with America to begin with. So when uh, all of a sudden Trump pulls out of the JCPOA and breaks that trust, um, of course they're going to say, hey, listen, we told you so, America is the enemy, right? So, um, and it makes it more difficult for our moderate to convey that we have to lead with diplomacy um, in Iran as well. So, um, mm -hmm. wow, yeah, that's super interesting, and I and that creates probably a cycle where our own American right wing, the U.S. right wing, uh, they hate us for our freedoms, and they're just constantly doing this uh, back and forth where they're they're amplifying the most extreme right wing people in 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 all these countries. That's that's wild. Um, we have yeah. Joan who is, uh, sorry, go ahead. Just to add in something real brief, going back to the question you asked earlier about um, uh, you know, the impact of sanctions here or why, we, why the government, US government is sanctioning more and more, a lot of it has to do with electoral pol politics in the United States. In right. terms of Venezuela, you know, it's appealing to a hard right Cuban American, Venezuelan American vote, and more importantly, campaign financing in Florida. And of course, it's really easy to say you're doing something against the United States' perceived enemies, such as Iran, North Korea, wherever, if you just apply more and more sanctions that appeases a very important kind of base of, of right-wing voters. Got it. Super interesting. Um, I, I have Joan with her, who had her hand up. I'm about to go to you, Joan. One quick follow-up on that, Leonardo. Um, this is, I'm gonna sound so ignorant, but are these other countries, they're aware of our electoral politics situation being insane, right? Yeah, but you know, what can they do about it? I mean, right, well, what can we, you know, well, this is what we're trying to do too, yeah. Yeah. All right. Just to add really quick, uh, Ryan, I think that um, here internally in the US with the rise of uh, movement for black lives, there's a cry for equity and equality. And I think that um, it has become so apparent, as Leonardo already mentioned, you know, people stand in solidarity from Venezuela with the Black Lives Matter. They do the same in Iran. And when you speak to Iranian, an average Iranian uh, young man or woman, they're more equipped in their knowledge of what happens with our electoral politics uh, versus myself, for example, who's lived here uh, for, for such a long time since the age of 11. So they're cognizant and they're very aware and they're in pain. So I would urge the Biden administration to act in with, with modesty and humility when it comes to um, approaching some of these countries that are going through the hardship that they're going through, so. Gotcha, thank you. Um, Joan, I'm getting to you now. You had your, uh, oh, your hand was raised by mistake. Okay, no worries then, that's okay. Um, if anyone else has any other questions, please ask now, we will get them asked. Is there anything else uh, Hanye or Leonardo that you want to add before we move on to our action. Uh, Hanye, we'll start with you real quick. Um, I would say this as, as someone who has uh, launched a campaign from uh, uh, from a feminism lens and, and as an Iranian American. And oftentimes I have to say, you know, we find ourselves in spaces where 
we have so many of our allies speaking um, uh, for our causes, but we don't necessarily engage our own communities in this conversation. And perhaps they're too scared to, to get involved. But I do urge everyone on this call and whoever is watching to really study what sanctions mean, because it's through a collective uh, effort uh, as a united front that we can confront um, some of these uh, war crimes that happen, silent war crimes that happen that are not often discussed or talked about. And, and I do recommend for everyone to watch documentaries on what happened in Iraq, because what happens is that 10 years of, of really killing over 500,000 children will probably have be the same in Iran or God forbid, you know, Venezuela or North Korea, but it's something that is not publicize or, or it's not a glamorous subject matter to talk about. So study as much as you can, urge your Congress members to take action. And if you are a delegate and if you are a member of, of uh, the Democratic Party, work on resolutions, work on initiatives that, or, or even um, introduce or allow for, for the bills that have come out to get co-sponsors. So that's uh, that would be the only thing I would, I would have to add, but yeah. Okay, uh, Leonardo, any closing thoughts? Sure, a couple of things. I think what Hani and I have been, been talking about is really the tip of the iceberg when it comes to sanctions. So please, please do educate yourselves. Visit sanctionskill.org. Visit liftsanctionssavelives.org. Visit liftthesanctions.org. And also, you know, I, I know people from all over the country are, are listening or watching. Do a search. If you subscribe to your local paper, go to their website. Do a search for a woman named Alina Duhan. That's A-L-E-N-A-D-O-U-H-A-N. She's the UN Special Rapporteur on the on the on the negative impact of unilateral coercive measures, sanctions, on the enjoyment of human rights. And she just wrote a very scathing preliminary report following a visit to Venezuela, denouncing the US sanctions and their impact. And I'm gonna read a quote real quick. The economic blockade of Venezuela and the freezing of central bank assets have a devastating effect on the whole population of Venezuela, especially those in extreme poverty, women, children, medical workers, people with dis disabilities or life-threatening or chronic diseases, and the indigenous population. The very vulnerable groups that Hani has been talking about all night. Yeah. And, and check her, look for her name because I can almost guarantee that her comments about the impact of sanctions on Venezuela have not been reported, but, and I can also guarantee that in a month and a half that this report came out, you'll probably find two or three articles saying terrible things about Venezuela and none of them talking about the impact of the sanctions. Right, yeah, it's the unfortunate part about our media. Um, uh, Susan Pelican, you had your hand up at one point. Um, I'm gonna hit ask to unmute on you and you can feel free to ask your question if you'd like, if you still have one. No, it was my hand was up for another reason. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, okay. Let me come back over here. So with that, we are going to move on to our action now. So I will spotlight my video. I'm gonna share my screen here shortly. Um, I'm gonna post the link now to our action. So what we are doing today, two, two simple asks for you. Well, one of them is super simple. The second one is calling your reps, which is what we really need to do. That's how we uh, create power. Oh, I, Leonardo, I'm sorry, I spelled Elena's name wrong. I tried. Um, the link that I just posted in the chat will take you to our document. I'm going to share my screen now so you will see that document. No problem, Leonardo. I, I enjoy, very much enjoy these conversations and I end up learning a lot every time. Um, so today we want you to sign and share this petition. If you click on the link, not on the screen, but in your chat box, click on the link in your chat box, and I will actually share the link separately as well. Um, this is the petition right there. Now we want you not just to sign it, signing it's really easy, but I also would urge you to please share this on your own personal social media, share it with your friends, um, get it out into the world. Go to Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I'm sure you're all on TikTok. So share it there. Um, we really need to spread the word on this. That is the, like one of the most important things we can do about this. I know for me, I've worked in politics for quite a while. I didn't know. 
I, anything about sanctions, it turns. I thought I understood them to some degree, but no, not really. They're very complicated. There's a lot going on. There's so many effects as Leonardo was um, uh, mentioning that we've only hit the tip of the iceberg tonight. So I urge you to please not just sign that petition, which you should do, but also share it on Facebook, share it in groups that you know, share it on email chain, share it to the uh, organizers in your community and the people that you know, um, so we can spread that and, and really get people more educated, uh, educate more progressives on what these sanctions are doing to countries and specifically related to COVID-19. We're in a pandemic and we're actively making it worse globally with these sanctions and we're, it's not good for anyone and we need to have um, some morality about what we're doing. So it's so important that we get in there. Um, so I would ask everyone to do that now. The second thing that we'll be doing, as we usually do, is calling our reps and senators. Now, like usual, I've provided the switchboard number, 202-224-3121, and I'll copy that and paste that as well so everybody has it. Super easy there. Call that number and you will get to a switchboard operator who will be tired and they'll say, who do you want me to, who you want to connect to? And you tell them your rep or your senator. If you're unsure who they are, ask and I will find it and I will tell you. If you don't know who your senator is, I have a link uh, in that document I've sent as well that you can very quickly find them. And I will show you what this call looks like real quick. 